This week, we're going to wrap up with these two buildings, Kimball Art Museum and Yale Center for British Art. So, Kimball Art Museum. It's in Fort Worth, Texas. And we see here uh, a grid. It's reminiscent of some other grids we've seen in Kahn's work. So we have A, B, A, B, A. The B's being very narrow. And then we have A, B, A, B, A, B, et cetera, this way. The B's being also narrow. So he's going to use these parts of the grid as joints between the three parts. And then this is going to be typically gallery space. And then this is in the ceiling plan where the mechanical bus. So we'll see that in a minute. We're set in a park. He makes the main entrance to the museum through a grove of trees and then parking back here and there's another entrance back here. So here's the main entrance through the grove of trees. He knocks out one of these units. And he adds a porch, which is like the other units, but not identical. And the entrance, I think, does not work very well. So here's what we have. When we see a concrete frame, travertine masonry wall in fill, and then the, these vault-like structures, we'll go into that in a sec, are sheathed in lead, which is a very traditional roofing material. So here we see Khan being very explicit about this is structure, this is infill. And this is, we see travertine, but it's actually a masonry wall. Travertine block, space, travertine. <laughs> uh, which is how you do a masonry wall. It's never one solid material. So these vaults, which we see here, we'll look at some more, uh, provide the interior of the museum for exhibiting the art. And <clears throat> these vault-like structures. Now, the, the proper term for these are cycloids, and the cycloid is the name of the curve. And the way you generate a cycloid, so you can make it could be a half circle, it could be a parabola, uh, it's a cycloid. The way you generate a cycloid is, imagine you have a dark room, you take a bicycle wheel, you put a light on the wheel right there, you then roll the wheel, and that light will follow, and you take a time-lapse photograph of it. That light will follow this curve. So it's a very gentle, elegant curve. It looks great. And it starts coming around toward the vertical, which helps bring the forces downward. Now we see this gallery space. And then in this transitional space up here, he's got the ducts. And so here are the edges of that space and uh, there are vents opening up, bringing the air into the space. Here you see him exploring some other um, curves for uh, the space. And here's a final. We have a lower uh, space and an upper space. And here he puts together one cycloid and one uh, transitional space together for the auditorium. So these are the stepped seatings for the auditorium. In the center of this form is an opening that runs down the length of it. And that brings in natural light. Now, what's the problem with natural light in a museum? Correct. Direct sunlight contains uh, ultraviolet, the ultraviolet will just chew up, uh, bleach the art and chew up the, uh, even chew up the uh, material. So, he hangs this curved perforated aluminum form here, and so the light comes in, gets reflected off of that form onto, so that it washes this 
curving exposed concrete. Talk about that more in a sec. There's also some perforations in here so some light comes through. And then we have up here plastic filters that are going to take out the... Um, and this curve is calculated so that it distributes the light evenly over this whole surface. Intuitively, Khan thought that would be curved this way. If you see right there, we can see it better here. And it turns out when the engineer actually calculated it, this is the curve. It gives you a uniform distribution. Um, here's our exterior structure. Here's our travertine, space, block, travertine. So this is a non-bearing infill wall, even though it's made of masonry. And then there's uh, air ducts in the floor as well. I don't remember which is, which is exhaust and which is supply, but it's in, um, there's ducts in the floor and then there's ducts here. So this is this cycloid effect. Here's our reflector perforated. We can see through it. Here's the opening above. And uh, here we see it reflecting the light, washing the concrete. So Kimball's were rich. Mr. Kimball died. Uh, Mrs. Kimball writing the check for the museum, a lot of money. <clears throat> and they're in here and they're taking the formwork off of the first vault. And Port Place Exposed Concrete looks sort of like a sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very unattractive material. So they looked up and they said, oh my God, we got an ugly building. Um, some architects work within a style, so all their buildings are similar. Khan makes everyone different, so you don't know what you're going to get. Well, once they put in these reflectors and the lights washing the concrete, they put in this trim, which sort of uh, gives a boundary to the concrete. It's luminous and very attractive. So, uh, who knew? Uh, so here's uh, an entrance foyer, here's a typical gallery, and here, if you come in the lower level, you come up the steps and there's two of these vaults springing up. When you get to the end wall, there's one here at the joint and one at the very end, Khan puts this band of glass here to tell you Okay, what is this telling you that there's glass here? That this wall is not holding up the cycloid. It's the columns at either end. Frank Lloyd Wright does that a lot. There'll be a band of glass running around. Um, um, for example, Johnson Wax between the wall and the ceiling. The columns are holding up the ceiling, not the wall. So there are ducts in here, and then right along this edge, there is supplying air out here. And this is concrete, structural, this is travertine infill, this is travertine infill. Now, he then has uh, clamps along here that hold these movable partitions, so you can sort of this flexible gallery space, but how the flexibility works is limited so that uh, you don't have the total haphazard possibilities that you had in Yale Art Gallery. Now we're going to see these flexible partitions in uh, Yale British Studies as well. Here again you see the light reflecting off this reflector and then washing down and making luminous this seal. And here you see the clamps that hold the partitions, which establishes where they can go. This partition has to start here. It can't start here or back here. So that you have flexibility, but there's some order limiting it. Uh, Khan is interested in every aspect of the building, from what does this building want to be, right down to details. 
so that they could spend all night in the office discussing a hinge for a door. So here is the handrail for one of the stairs coming up from the lower level. And so you want something fat here, rounded and fat, that you can grab with your hand. But, so you think, well, why don't we just make a round tube? Why doesn't Khan make a round tube? Why is it this configuration? Because round tube, particularly if you close it off at the end, is saying this is a solid cylinder. It's not, it's hollow. <laughs> if this was solid, it would fall off the wall. If it's, if it's made out of sheet metal, Khan wants you to know it's made out of sheet metal. But he also doesn't want you grasping the edge of the sheet metal, so it's rounded like this, but the end is open and it's open here so that you know it's sheet metal. It's not a, a solid bar or a hollow tube. It's trying to look like a solid bar. Now, in Salk, he uses extruded railings that are, uh, that are light, extruded aluminum railings that are light, but again, he shows you that. He doesn't try to beef them up. So he wants you to know what it is. Remember, in Exeter, we have travertine on that big curving stair, uh, but he shows you the edge to tell you that, well, you can't structure a stair out of travertine. So it's a concrete stair, The travertine is uh, just a surfacing material. There are two entrances to, to the building. The main entrance is here. We come in, we saw those two women with the hats. Uh, they're right in here. So you come in here and then bingo, you go right into the galleries. Problem is we're in Texas. Nobody walks to this museum. There's a big park here. No one's going to come through the park. The parking lot is here. So you come down, you're not gonna hike up around here in 110 degree sun to go in through the grove of trees here. You just go in here. Not really thinking it through, Khan makes that. He drops out this wall. This is a giant beam, huge span. And it, it looks like you're entering through a truck loading dock. Whereas the, the real entrance is beautiful, it's got the porches, it's got a grove of trees. So Khan was ne never had a driver's license. <laughs> he just didn't grasp automobiles. So here is the, what Khan conceives of as the entrance through this grove of trees. Uh, two porches framing it with fountains in them. You come into this as a, the lobby, and then you go into the various galleries. He cuts them open occasionally for light courts. But this is how you really enter. Uh, you drive in here, you park down here, and you enter through here. Now, what do museums do that until recently libraries also did? They expand, <laughs> they keep buying art. People keep donating art. So, um, this was a very ambitious museum, a very ambitious director, and he want, they wanted to expand. So there's an architect who was a colleague of Kahn's at the University of Pennsylvania named Romaldo Jurgola. Jurgola is still alive, he won a competition to um, expand the capital Cambria of Australia, and he ended up moving there. So he has offices in Philadelphia and New York, Mitchell Jurgola, but um, he lives in, uh, in the East. I'm not sure if he's living in Australia, but he sort of does a lot of buildings in Singapore too. So they had Jurgola design, imagine exactly like this, and add it on here. And same thing on the other side. 
So, and if you look at the modularity of this thing, you would say, well, I could believe it was Kahn's intention that this should be able to expand and just add more modules. And it won't disturb Kahn's design because these modules will look exactly like this. Well, big uproar, you can't disturb a Kahn building. Um, and you can argue it two ways. Uh, a museum should be able to expand. But then the argument the other way is, Khan is really a remarkable, important architect. There's only a half a dozen of his buildings. We shouldn't mess with them. Now, the alternative argument is, if we made all our buildings this good, we wouldn't mind having one of them altered. But when there's only five or six of them, they're very precious, and you want to preserve them. So that's the argument either way. So they expanded it over here. <laughs> that's the expansion. And this is part of a park that has some other museums, including one by Philip Johnson. So we lost some of the park. Um, and this is the expansion to the museum. So, any questions about Kimball? Okay, we're going to get out early. You guys get here, get here on time, you can get back to work. <laughs> um, so, Yale Center for British Art, and British Art Studies, it's had all kinds of names. I think this is the current one. This was um, the last building Khan worked on and, and got finished. He died before it was finished. There's uh, the Roosevelt Memorial by Khan off of Manhattan was <clears throat> done in 72 and finished just like two years ago. So you could say that's the last building because it's finished two years ago. Uh, so you, but you know, if you want to really say last building he was working on. This is it. So, where, anybody, has anybody seen this building? Nobody's in Donald, anybody had Donald Cromley's studio? Donald's very good at field trips. So, uh, they go, they go here. Yale is a real architecture museum. Saren, Rudolph, Kahn, Philip Johnson, um, on and on. Well, this is the Yale Art Gallery by Louis Kahn that we looked at when we looked at Kahn's early work. And anybody know where we're standing to take this photograph? On the roof of Paul Rudolph's Yale Art and Architecture Building. So this is a pretty important corner. So uh, what do we have? Well, first of all, the story is, this guy named um, Mellon, Andrew Mellon, and he's the son of the guy who built the, he was a very rich guy and he became Secretary of Treasury, Andrew Mellon Sr. And Mellon Jr. Uh, is a philanthropist. He doesn't, he never did anything to earn money, he just gave it away. So the father built the National Gallery in Washington, uh, the son built the IMP East Wing and this. And he collected British art. So this is a museum for British art. We have a concrete structural frame, very rectilinear, boom, 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 a real grid. We have, this concrete is exposed. We are leaving out every other column here to maximize storefront. So this building does something that a lot more buildings should do. And that is, this could be a huge wall really killing the street. What makes streets alive is stores, shops. So this building's, and in New York, if there is anything commercial in a building, it's either a bank or a CVS. 
you know, the idea of there being shops, some variety, something to look in a window, something to do. So this does that. The shops along here. The infill material is stainless steel. There was a very special stainless steel. It's a stainless steel that did not go through the last polish, the last polishing process. And so it's very, it has a pewter or slate-like color and texture to it. So here is our grid. Here we're leaving out every other column along here for the storefronts. Here are the stores. Down here, you can see a little light through here. We knock out this corner. We have no partition here. So that this is like we come underneath the building here. This is all open. And the door is here. We then come into a tall... So this is ground floor. This is the top floor. So we come in here and we're in this space that goes up to the skylights. This is a grid of skylights on the roof. We then go up the stairs or elevators, circulate in the galleries, on the typical floor or the top floor, and then our feet are tired, so we go into this light court and with some sofas and rest our feet. And the ceiling, we have these very large Y-shaped beams, and they have in this space mechanical air ducts. So here's the ground floor. There's a lot of other things going on. There's a library. There's an, on the lower level, there's an auditorium, etc. Now, Kahn's notion is that this pewter, um, this pewter-like stainless steel would glow in the sunlight. It does. This is facing west in the setting sun. But mostly, it's just dull. It's kind of dull and impressive. Here we see the shops, and here we can barely see that in this corner, it's all open. So we go into this corner, and here we are underneath. Now there's a column here. This plan leaves the column out, but there's actually one there. And right here are the doors into the building. So we come up to this door, we go through the door, and here's the door, and we look up, and we're in this tall, skylit space. Now, throughout the building, these skylights have a lot of defense against direct sun. There are, you can't see out them. They're tinted, they have ultraviolet filters, they have basically Venetian blinds, fins, to block direct sunlight, but those do to protect the paintings. But there's no paintings in here. So uh, we can look up and see, see sky and clouds. Interior, we still see the concrete frame, and the infill is now light oak. So it's supposed to sort of have the feel of an English manor house. And these are sort of reflective of the great oak beams. And then this would be the oak paneling, modernized. On some floors, we're this floor, there's a lot of drawings here, very sensitive to light. So they're very they're protected from this light up here the light can get in. And we can, on the top floor, lean on this railing and look across and look down into the space. So here we are looking up, and you see these giant beams that are hollow, and they're, they're sort of uh, V-shaped. 
and inside there is a duct. So we're, here we are in this entrance space, and then we go over here, and here's where we buy our ticket, elevators, and over here are the stairs, and we go into the galleries. So now we've gotten out of the elevator or stair on the top floor, and we can see across. We can look up at the skylights down into the space. And then here are these big beams. And just barely see, I gotta get a better slide. Uh, here we see the ducks. Just to tell you how old I am. <laughs> this, the reason why this slide's not very good is I took this from a book as a film slide. That was then scanned to be digital to put in this presentation. So I either had to go back to the book and scan it directly, or this stuff is just showing up on Google Image. So I, you know, it's like, I, I've I spent over $100,000 on books over the years. And to this day, I still spend 5,000 a month on a mini storage for my books. And this is after getting rid of half of them. And you don't, just don't need them anymore. <laughs> it's all on Google Image. These are mostly coffee table books with great images because I teach every single period in architectural history. So I had, I had over 100,000 slots. And now you just go online and grab them. Anyway, uh, here we see partitions but they have to be on the grid of these, the square grid of these guys. So we have the square grid. We can put partitions anywhere along these grid lines. And you can see the partitions have pegs. These are spring-loaded pegs to hold them in place. And you keep the partitions in the basement, and you move them in here and wedge them into place. So here are our, you can just barely see the space here. Here are our movable partitions. So you can make this room, yet the partitions can go anywhere along this grid line, which is the same as this. Here are openings for the AC air. Now, something interesting. This is our column grid, a column on the grid. And now let's just jump downstairs. And here's that column downstairs. See how small it was relative to this grid? This grid here is the same here. Now it's filling the whole space. This is the second floor. This is the fourth floor. So the columns get bigger at each level as they go down because they're carrying more weight. So here are our columns, here's our movable partitions. Here's our big hollow beams and there are ducts in there, which you can see a little bit better here. So these are the shape of the beams, these are the ducts, and then here, up here, is our skylights so first we have these fins. So if sun's coming this way, it can't get in directly. This is north, no direct sun. And when you get direct sun, it's protected by these fins in this surface. Then we have this double layer of lens. And that is, has in it um, stuff to filter out ultraviolet. And then here is a Lentner lens, like this right here on this here. See this texture on here? That makes the light get distributed. So it won't just come straight from the bulb, it gets distributed in all directions. So the light finally gets to here and gets distributed in all directions. So that's the lighting system. 
So here's our protection against the north light. Here's the double lens. It's also providing um, thermal insulation. Here is the Lettner lens, which then distributes the light. Here is our stainless steel wall. And here we've got air ducts in the floor again. Now, on the top floor, here are our ducts in the structure. Come down to a lower floor, the ducts are exposed. So here's what those guys look like. And here we see the column's bigger. It's filling this edge to edge. Okay, now we've been um, looking at the art and our feet are tired. So we come to this courtyard here, this light court. So this is the entrance court. These are the spaces in the museum, all flexible, changeable. And then this is the light court. This is only three stories. This one was four. And we have sofas here where we can sit. And we can also exhibit here the paintings that are too big for a typical floor. And then this is the stair, which is this big round form jutting into this space. So here's the stair inside here. I mean, you've got to be an architect to like this, right? <laughs> I mean, the ordinary person says, why is there a granary silo in the museum? But as architects, we think it's really cool. This is a great cylinder dropping in here. So here are, is the grid of... Now there's trees everywhere, so it's a good thing we got the original picture I showed you earlier. Here's our concrete frame. Here's our stainless steel infill. Here's our grid of skylights. Here is Kahn's Yale Art Gallery. And we're standing on the roof of Paul Rudolph's Art and Architecture Building. This is a building by Kevin Roach, who inherited Saarinen's firm when Saarinen died. And Saarinen has three buildings here, two buildings here as well. 